Hello, everyone, and welcome to Season 2 of Link Ahead, the City of Dublin podcast. All right, Bruce, I know you would never play favorites with any of our episodes or our guests, but you are a huge sports guy. True. You're an athlete. Your kids play baseball and softball, and I know what a huge baseball fan you are. So uh, today's guest has pitched in three World Series. He's also one of our most famous Dublin residents. You're about to jump out of your seat to start this episode, so why don't you just continue with the introduction? So how's this for part of a resume? After establishing himself as one of the dominant pitchers ever to come out of Dublin Kaufman High School, he was drafted fifth overall in 86, ahead of guys like Gary Sheffield, Bo Jackson, and in the bigs, he was part of two no-hitters over an 18-year career. Wow. A combined no-no and then a solo no-hitter against the Dodgers in 94. <laughs> and I can't wait to dig into all this. <laughs> He then won a World Series ring in the Atlanta, with the Atlanta Braves in 95. And by the way, he's a heck of a pickleball player these days. <laughs> uh, wait, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Kent Merker to Link Ahead. Hey, thanks for having me. Kent, welcome. We're so glad to have you here. We'll have to talk about pickleball in a little bit. Absolutely. But <laughs> where do we start? Why don't we begin with the calendar? So opening day for the MLB is March 30th. That's mm-hmm. why we wanted you on for this particular episode. Uh, what do you miss most about being a Major League Baseball player, especially this time of year? Well, uh, Opening days were always special, no matter where you were. And, and I was fortunate enough to be with the Reds for five years, and their opening days, second to none. Right. I mean, they do it. It's a extravaganza. But two things. One, you made the Major League Club, so you could put that worry <laughs> behind you. And secondly, <laughs> just, just the excitement from the fans and just the cities in general for opening day. But unfortunately in Cincy, that the second day it wasn't. Anywhere near <laughs> Not as exciting. and interested in, this, in the team, but we'd always be one and zero oh and one, and then they're like, "Yeah, here we go again." But, oh boy. but you know, the thing I miss most is is just you don't think about it when you're doing it, but just to be able to compete, to say you're competing at the highest level of a particular sport, because as much as I golfed and now pickleball and other things I've done, I'll never be able to do it at the highest level. So, so I miss that just the competition, mm-hmm. how good those guys actually were and just the challenge of trying to go out there and get them out. Do you still like going to the stadium as a fan? Yeah. Well, I'm actually, I work as a baseball agent now. So part of my job is going to watch baseball games. A lot of them are minor league games. Yeah. Kids were recruiting. I, I still love going to games and, and it's fun in my job now, the capacity I'm in, I can be around it enough, but I don't have to be gone eight months a year. Like sure when you're playing. So I can still see my family that's all grown up and old now, but uh, I, I kind of have some time on my own to do, to do what, to play pickleball every day and things like that. <laughs> right. And, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, I still love the game. The I rules, mean, the rules are getting a little weird on ooh. me, but oh. all right. So I have to, what's going to be a bigger impact in this season, the no shift or the pitch clock? I think no shift. Okay. I think that's going to, which I, listen, I don't care if you can shift. I mean, guys are big enough, they're at the, or good enough at that level, they should be able to hit it the other way. But I think that's going to make a bigger impact for a lot of left-handed pull power hitters that, yeah. that hit balls, hard ground balls that the second baseman's playing in right field. But the pitch clock, I've seen, I've already seen, I don't know if you saw Max Scherzer or take yep, advantage of I saw it. it. And that's what guys are going to start doing. And, and it's within the rules, and it's, I think, an unintended consequence. But I think guys are going to figure it out, and they're going to manipulate it, and it's going to be tougher on the hitter. I agree. I mean, we watched it at the Clippers at the uh, minor league level, but they never there was no consequence to yeah. either the hitter or the batter. And so all of a sudden, like you know, we saw it day one of spring training, yeah. somebody it decided the outcome of a game. A, stri- a strikeout. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, one of the Braves hitters. Right. Yeah. And he's sitting up there. We're ready to go hit, and the umpire calls him out. I'm like, Right. I mean, if I'm pitching there, I'm fired up, obviously. Right. But, but that's just not the way the game was intended to be played. No, no, no. And it's like if you're a baseball purist, you're not looking for uh, – like somebody asked me – I remember I had a kid one time ask me that I was coaching. He was like, when's the game over? I go, that's the beauty of baseball. You don't know when the game is over. We're here till it's finished. Yep. Well, you were born in Dublin, and we mentioned in your days at Kaufman High School, you played baseball in every city imaginable and could have retired anywhere in the world. Uh, so why did you come back to, to Dublin here? You know, I love it here. Like I said, I've been here forever, and, and I've watched this city grow up. I mean, I, I think I had 210 in my graduating class. Oh, wow. Wow. In 86. And in one high school. In one right. high school, right. yeah. And well, people still ask me which one I went to. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. man, I'm 55. <laughs> there, there wasn't even a 
there were there were four policemen, I think, or six policemen <laughs> oh, wow. in, so on the force. <laughs> but you know what? We always maintained a home here. My daughters, well, my oldest was born in Atlanta when I was playing there, but my other two were born here at Riverside, and and all my family's here. My wife's family's here. So it was just, it was for my family. If I got traded or if I was on a long road trip, they always had some place to call home where they had people around them that they knew. And it just, I, I just love the city. I mean, schools are great. I mean, just everything about this city is, is, is outstanding. And it's, it's a perfect place to retire, raise a family and then retire. Right. So let's stay on the topic of this city. So, you know, we have some of the nicest pickleball courts around and they're just a few hundred feet away from where we're recording right now at City Hall. <laughs> so you just took up pickleball like three or four years ago and you've already played in the U.S. Open in Florida. What is it about the sport you like so much and what translates from baseball to pickleball? Well, one, the competitiveness translates. Okay. But uh, what drew me to it, a buddy of mine that actually used to open the pickle shack up in Delaware asked me to play it one day three and a half years ago. And I'm like, I've never even heard of this. <laughs> so I Google it. And of course, the, the default video is for 75-year-old people <laughs> at the villages. At the I'm playing it, and you're like, never. Yeah. I'm not playing it. I mean, what, what's the point? And then he sends me another video. I'm like, oh, wow, okay. And I never played, I'd never played paddle sports or racket right. sports growing up, so I wasn't very good. <laughs> I, I, I had... Decent hand-eye coordination. I was still kind of quick, but I was getting beat up by people that I'm looking at going, no way yep. am I losing to this. It's the great equalizer. And I never said it out loud, maybe four <laughs> times. But And I said, I want to get good at this. And it was just a challenge for me. So, And now it's a great way, like I was talking to you guys earlier, get up early, get up, get a sweat, yeah. compete, listen to some music, have fun, and then get your day going. So... But it's the most addicting sport I've ever played. <laughs> it, it truly is. And I can't explain it. And, and there's something. I haven't gotten the pickleball keychain yet. I, I refuse no. to do that. Oh, boy. I'm not getting the personalized plate that says <laughs> dink this or whatever. I'm, I'm not doing any of that. But I will play that game seven days a week. Oh, yeah. so you play seven days a week. And we, we mentioned uh, we have courts right here next yes. to City Hall. So where do you play? Uh, well, I've played here a played lot. There? And, yeah. and they've done such a good job. And, and I've heard that they might build more. Mm -hmm. They left room across to build more, and I think they're going to need it. Mm -hmm. But to offer this, and, and for Dublin to be what I would call, because I've been to a lot of other cities with my travel, and, and they're just catching up to pickleball. Mm -hmm. So for Dublin to get out in front of it and, and kind of pioneer it, if you will, and they're quality courts. They're dedicated. They're, they're not lined for tennis and then painted lines. Right. I mean, they're dedicated courts, and they, they've done a f fabulous job with those courts. Baseball's over 100 years old. So are you shocked by how fast pickleball has just dominated? <laughs> no. I, I mean, I'm shocked, <laughs> but I get it. I don't understand it, but I'm not shocked. I mean, I think three years ago when I started, they said there was 3 million people playing. Yeah. Now there's like eight, and they predict in four or five years there'll be 40 million people in the country playing pickleball. That's crazy. Now, it'll, it'll be more than golf. That's Lindsay is a tennis player, so her transition <laughs> to pickleball was not seamless. When you go to swing at a pickleball, you have the short short paddle and a ball that doesn't bounce. Right. So there was a lot of whiffing going on, and well, Bruce and you Bruce can't spin it either. It. Yeah, it's completely different. So. Well, I've played with a lot of p <laughs> former tennis players, like D one college type players, and all that, and they basically said it's. It's for people that can't – pickleball is for people that aren't good enough to play tennis. Yeah. <laughs> and that may be that. true because I never played <laughs> tennis, but but they fought it. And then the ones that finally came over to the dark side, now they're playing every day, and they love it. All right, last pickleball question, then we'll move back <laughs> no, to let's baseball. make this all about pickleball. Who cares about baseball? <laughs> you talk, so. Do you play singles or doubles? I mostly play doubles. Mostly doubles. Yeah. Okay. I'll play, I don't have the, the technique yet and the skills – I need a better backhand to play singles. I yeah. can move good enough. Mm -hmm. And at 55, I can get in that older age group. There you go. And hopefully just outlast them. But uh, <laughs> no, I usually play doubles with a better partner. And I yeah. just kind of stay out of the way and let them do their thing. <laughs> that works. Okay, well, let's bring it back to baseball as opening day is upon us. Uh, we got to ask, who is going to be good this year? And how do you think the Reds and the Guardians look? Well, I think, I mean, perennially, you know the Dodgers are going to be there. The Astros are going to be there. Uh, the Mets spent $467 million. You would think they would be there. They just lost their closer <laughs> right. celebrating in the That's right. WBC. The Yankees will obviously be competitive. Um, those are probably the top four. 
and as far as the Reds, listen, I, I like the team. I mean, it's 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 similar to Cleveland. There's a lot of names on offense that aren't household names. Right. There's one or two, like Joey Votto, obviously, and but they've got Cleveland always pitches. Right. They always figure out a way to just be competitive on the mound. And if you can do that, that gives you a chance every year mm-hmm. to compete. The Reds, they've got three really good young pitchers with potential, I say, with Hunter Green and the Lodolo, Nick yeah. Lodolo, and then Brendan Williamson. I mean, with those three guys, as young as they are, if they figure it out, same thing. And they've got a good enough bullpen that they can, they can compete every night, which a lot of teams can't say that. So, but they've got that core young pitching. They've got enough offense. It's just a matter of going out and being consistent. All right. Speaking of marks on the calendar, on April eighth of this year, it'll be twenty ninth anniversary of your no, 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 no against the Dodgers. Now, take us back to that game. Um, I'm not sure. Like, I'll talk to my son. I, next I fell week. asleep in the fifth <laughs> minute. So go ahead. <laughs> it's not true at all. Not true at all. Take us back. All right. So you're playing the Dodgers, and you just mentioned the Dodgers. They've always been oh, a contender in baseball. Mm-hmm. Like. It, was there what was what was it like that day? Was it something different? I mean, did you feel it? No, you know what? It, it, it was. It, we opened up. It was my first game out of spring training, which would never happen today because they don't let kids go past right. seventy five yeah, pitches. Yeah, yeah. And God forbid you get to a hundred, <laughs> right. and they, they call the <laughs> SWAT team on you. But, uh, we opened up. We had four in San Diego. And I was the fifth starter with Glavin, Maddox, Smoltz, Avery in front of me. So yeah. I was the fifth. So it was open. It was you might have heard of those guys too. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, right. Yeah. Uh, well, if you haven't heard of them, you certainly haven't heard of me. So <laughs> you may have had the wrong person on the mic right now. But yeah, uh, no, it was just a Friday night. It was it was our first game in L.A. and my night to go. And I just kept going out there and kept getting outs. And next I, thing you know, it's I'm literally. Sitting in the clubhouse going, what just <laughs> happened? That is amazing because you watch, like, as no-nos go and you watch it on TV and, like, players stop talking to you. At what point did everyone stop talking to you in the dugout just let you do your thing? I was almost the anti-superstition, superstitious guy. Okay. So I said, guys, I know what's going on. After, like, the fifth inning, I said, I know what's <laughs> going on. You guys normally come up and talk to me. Right. Just continue to do what you would have normally done. Gotcha. I remember Mark Lemke was our second baseman. Yeah. It, was, it was kind of a chilly night in L.A. that night. And – Someone asked me if I wanted a coffee, and he goes, no, 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 don't give him caffeine. <laughs> don't, don't wake him up. He's sleeping out there. Let him go. So, But, no, I, I, I wanted – I didn't like people. I knew what was going on. I mean, the scoreboard's right there. Right. I can yeah, look at that zero. Yeah. Was there a play that someone on defense oh, yeah. just, like, saved the day? Well, I, 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 I spin the story <laughs> <laughs> that I didn't want to throw a perfect game. Okay. So I walked one of the guys. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he was actually stealing on the pitch. Yeah. Caro's hit a ball right over my head. But Lemke was covering second for yeah, the stolen uh-huh. base and was just literally standing right where the ball was hit. If I don't walk that guy, there's a base hit up the middle. And right. You guys are talking to someone else in Dublin right <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've told a story, and it's a great one, where you may be the only MLB pitcher in history to throw a no-no and then not make your next start. Yeah, so same night, Friday, April 8th, 1994, you know, I do all the interviews and the local media, our media from WTBS and Atlanta. And so after everything settles down, guys are showered, ready to get on the bus. Bobby calls me, and Bobby Cox, our manager, calls me into his office. And he says, hey, man, great game. You know, wow, fun to watch this and that. But he goes, we have an off day Monday, and I'm going to keep the other four guys on their normal day, so we're going to skip you. (laughs) And I was like, (laughs) me? (laughs) At least he waited 40 minutes. Oh, my god!" And didn't tell me, like, during the high fives (laughs) off the field. But, yeah, and I just said, you know what? And and I I tell that story to people that play currently, and they're like, man, did you tell them, you know, do that? I said, I was Bobby Cox, no. Because I said, if I would have said, I think I've earned the right to pitch in five days, he would have called our traveling secretary in there, Bill Acre, and he would have said, hey, get Merck a flight down to Richmond. Oh, my goodness. Triple A, he wants to pitch on Ooh. Wednesday. Wow. <laughs> and he would have gone. Right and I would have been on a flight and been going like, you <laughs> dummy, <laughs> just say okay. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I missed. I, I guarantee I'm the only one that got skipped. Oh, wow. Well, and, and, you know, you mentioned Bobby Cox, and you talked about the Braves, and you were there at the beginning. The Braves used to be like a doormat. We were horrible. I mean, barely winning games. And mm-hmm. then all of a sudden you get this great pitching and you're part of this, just this juggernaut. 
I mean, what was that like? You know what? I, I got called up at 89, and I think, and I, I don't remember the exact number, but it was in the 90s in losses. And then in 90, again, we lost 90-plus games. Right. But it was me and Ave and Smoltz and Glav and Pete Smith and Lemke and all the guys we grew up with in the minor leagues. We just kind of moved up together. Yeah. So we knew each other, right? And we knew, I mean, on and off the field. It, it, was, it was just a tight-knit family type atmosphere and then the beautiful beautiful thing and what doesn't happen today is Bobby allowed us to fail at the big league level and not worry about losing our job wow. where hey go figure it out right you're one of our guys that's why we drafted you to where we did and Smoltzy and Abe those are all first round second round picks like figure it out because we're building we want you to be part of this need you to so we didn't have the pressure it's already enough pressure facing some of the hitters we had to face but Oh yeah. To also worry about getting sent down because you two bad games and now you're in Triple A. Right. It, he allowed us and gave us the confidence to go out there and trusted us to to win on the job or to learn on the job. Which today it's more transactional. Oh sure. What are you doing yeah, for yeah. me right now? Because we need to win because we've got this much in the payroll and our owners want. It's a di- different atmosphere. And it's a great atmosphere. Today, right. Don't get me wrong, but we were just given the opportunity to learn on the job. You pitched for um, Atlanta mm-hmm. in 95, mm-hmm. and, and you know Bruce and I are, are Cleveland fans. So what was that like? What was uh, what was it like playing against Cleveland? I had a front row seat watching some Hall of Famers do their business is what I had. <laughs> now, you know what? It was awesome. Like, it, there's no way to describe, one, pitching in the big leagues. Like, I literally wish everyone could do it for one day or hitting in the big leagues. Just the feeling. It's just the smell of the grass is different. Everything's different. But to be in the World Series, and this is what and this is what I miss too. We were talking about this a couple months ago with with some guys I work with. But to know that, like when I was pitching in that World Series, if anyone watched baseball, there was no other game on the planet on. Right? They didn't Japanese leagues over Mexico, right. so <laughs> everybody that loved baseball had to watch me, and I loved that. I was like, this this is so cool, and now. It was cold that in the Cleveland that world. Yeah. I mean, oh, it yeah. snowed. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I, I look back at that lineup and. Oh, the 90s. Oh, oh so my gosh. goodness. That's the best lineup. <laughs> they had. I mean, I get the big red machine. No, no offense to them. But I would hard rival to find a better lineup one through nine. Sandy Alomar Jr. Oh. hit eighth in that lineup. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Cleveland, eighth. They had. They had f- Five guys that hit over 300. You're lucky to get one guy that hits over 300 on a team yeah. now. Well, you, Kenny Lo- and Kenny Lofton, oh. fringe Hall of Famer, right? right. I think uh, Omar Vizquel should be a Hall of Famer. Should be a Hall of Famer. Then you got, uh, oh, it was uh, Carlos Baerga. Right. Then you got Albert Bell. Then you had Manny Ramirez. Then you had Jim Tomei. <laughs> then you had Eddie Murray. Yeah. Then you had Sandy Almar Jr. And then the ninth guy was Paul Sorrento. A Sorrento, mm-hmm. or if it was a righty pitching, it or a lefty pitching, it was. Um, my, oh, that's when Murray may have been yeah, in there. Yeah, but it's like there was no, and all of them had thirty home runs, right. hundred RBIs, stolen bases. They could do everything. If you would have been pitching for Cleveland, then they would have <laughs> won. Would've won. <laughs> <laughs> they needed. That's what they needed. They needed somebody else, another <laughs> arm in there. No, they needed Maddox or Glavin or Smoltz to no, pitch for them. That would, and they had a great rotation. Athletes always say to, to get to the top, it's more mental than physical. And pitching is is more mental, right? 100%. Okay. It is. I mean, and, and again, I'm working with younger kids now in my job, and, and it's easier because I have the, the uh, perspective now, having been that age, and then pitching until I was 40 in the big leagues and now being old. <laughs> I wish I could have done some things different young that I didn't do. Sure. And it's all about – the mental side. Guys guys that get to the big leagues are good. Mm-hmm. It, it, and it doesn't mean they throw hard. It doesn't mean – but whatever they do, it works. And we always say stuff will get you there. Your mind's going to keep you there, right, because you have to make adjustments. Right. You can't do the same things against big league hitters that you do to A-ball hitters or high school right. hitters or college hitters. So, But you have to be one – you've probably heard this. You have to – it's a game of amnesia. You got to mm-hmm. forget what happened sure. the day before, yep. right. good or bad, just forget it. And I always played with with the for the mental side. What helped me is, and I forget who told me this. Young in my career, early in my career, is 
you're never as good as you think you are, <laughs> but you're never as bad as you think you are. Figure out somewhere, yeah. you're just somewhere in between. <laughs> and then you don't start riding these right? highs and lows, right. the crest and the trials of, of – because it's a long season. And yeah. if you start getting too – think you're too good, you're going to get – Someone will figure Someone's going to knock you down. And you if know? you think you're horrible, you know, that's tough to deal with. So, uh, yeah, that mental side, if, if you can just trust what you do mm-hmm. and say, I'm here for a reason. I don't need to change anything I did in, that I was doing in triple A. That's why I'm here. Right. Guys try to overdo it and think I got to do better at this and I got my curveballs got to be. No, now you just have to be more consistent. Sure. And mentally, you just got to be strong and just say, I can handle good or bad. Well, something else happened to you on the mound in 2000, and this gives me chills, honestly. A cerebral hemorrhage while you were pitching for the Angels. Doctors took you to the hospital and likely saved your life by preventing the brain bleed from becoming an aneurysm. What caused it, and is that something you've had to monitor ever since? No. You know, it, it was the craziest night ever, obviously. It gave you chills. Yeah. It gave me a horrible headache. <laughs> but I was, it's second inning. I, I, I was pitching against the Rangers in Anaheim. And I just threw a pitch and felt like my, like when you take off on an airplane and you're, you're, yep, pop oh, your yeah. nose yeah, yeah, yeah. to get your ears to right. unclog. Mm. It just kind of felt like that. And the trainer's looking at me. I'm like, I'm all right. And then I threw like three more pitches. And then, I mean, it literally felt like someone hit me on the back of the head with a, with a bat. And I just went down to my knees. Getting to the clubhouse, they're taking my blood pressure. It was like 220 over 140. Wow. And they're like, what is going? And then I started getting nauseous, and the doctor goes, "Get him out of here." Yeah, and yeah, I went to the hospital a mile away from the stadium, and they just they did a CAT scan, and it mm-hmm. showed that I had bleeding on the back of my brain in the center. For whatever reason, it it the vessel burst, it sealed itself off. I didn't have an aneurysm or an AVM, which is a whole nother thing. Right. But for whatever reason, they said it was hypertensive. You just your blood pressure got real high for some reason, and a vessel was a week burst it wow. wow so i spent 12 days in the hospital gained like 17 pounds because they had me on <laughs> prednisone for sure. swelling and i was just oh, like whatever and but yeah it was it, you know what i'd like to say it was scarier than it was but right. I, I didn't know what was going on sure right. yeah, had yeah. you told me it was going to mm-hmm. happen tonight and it happened i would have been scared mm-hmm. but right. I, I didn't know it was gonna, i thought i'm fine i'm 30 years old i think at the time or 31 i'm like this is nothing yeah and then they tell me the next day like dude you're lucky and right. i'm like Really? Uh-huh. And they're like, well, you never know with these. You have, if it's an aneurysm, you got like four hours to fix it. Right. So, yeah. And the doctor, I, he looked like Albert Einstein. <laughs> His hair. That's who that's that's like you the, want, though. That's who I was picturing. <laughs> oh, yeah. it, 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 but it was just boof. Like, yeah. and I'm like, really? He, he didn't look qualified. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> I was like, dude, I know it's late, but where's A team? Yeah. Can we get, no. But he, they were great. And that actually, that doctor told me to never play again. Wow. He goes, I wouldn't risk it. So I went to a younger doctor at USC that did another angiogram where they inject the dye in yeah, your brain yeah. and all that. And he's like, there's no reason you can't play again. So that was 2000. I made it eight years after that. But, yeah, it was a, it was an interest. And my family wasn't out there yet. Oh, they gosh. were still all here. They were watching on television. Oh, I can't imagine oh, what they my were God. thinking. Well, and, and, and they're like, yeah, it doesn't look right. Like, like that's not – He's acting funny, and I'm just like, yeah, I'm on both knees, like holding my head. I, I don't know what was going on, but oh my god! Fortunately, I'm I'm depending on who you're asking. I made it through, <laughs> and it was another experience and a lesson and a life lesson. And I mean, and that's where, like, you know, a, a sore arm, a torn ACL. What did you learn from that that whole experience? You know what? I I never took the game for granted ever. Yeah, and that taught me that for one and two, just. Honestly, how important your teammates are. I mean, they came and visited me every day uh, when my family wasn't there yet. And it just, you kind of put things in, in perspective a little more. Like, sure. this is a game. It's a great game. It, if I wish any everyone could do it, but it's not as important as your family, right. your friends. And, you know, if that was it for me, great. You know, I would have had more years to spend with my kids watching them play softball and volleyball and <laughs> sure. doing their thing when yeah. I was gone doing it for myself. But fortunately it just, it, it, it happened and it went away. They said it was like, you got struck by lightning. Wow. That's, that's about the odds. Wow. I was actually the first case study on that. They had not had any professional athlete 
because they were asking me like, "Hey, do you mind signing off? Then we can use you." And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, you can te- teach about me in college." Did I guess I never went to the Merker now. I need an NIL deal for that. That's it. <laughs> Looking back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'm sure parents come up to you all the time and say, hey, my kid can really hum a fastball or, you know, my kid wants to play in the bigs like you did. What's your best advice for both young players and their parents on how hard to push their kids? Well, first for the kids, <laughs> I, I, to this day, would, would still encourage kids to play more than one sport. Yeah. Personally, I, I think I won't get off on a tangent on injuries in baseball and, and t- Tommy Johns and all that, but I think because kids are playing it 12 months a year, they're not, right. it's repetitive mm-hmm. damage to your arm or trauma, right? So you need to take time, cross train. I played basketball, football, baseball up until my sophomore year. Then my dad, some scout told my dad not to let me play football anymore. But <laughs> I would just encourage him to keep trying stuff and, and have fun with it. Work hard, be the good teammate, but have fun with it. Right. And, and, and and I've seen it. My, my dad, when, he, when I got home, he worked, and he didn't get to go to all my games in high school. The first question was, did you finish your homework? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. Okay, well, how'd you pick? <laughs> it, it, he, it, but keep things in perspective. That's great. 99.9% of the kids that are playing at Dublin High School, any one of them right now, aren't gonna, won't play in college. Right. And then the ones that do, 99.9% of those won't play above that level. Right. Mm-hmm. Have fun with it. Yeah. If, if you're lucky enough, like I was, because I worked hard, I was blessed with a good left arm, just have fun. Because mm-hmm. yeah. if you want to be in the big leagues, it is a business. So don't make it a business when you're 10, 11, 12. Yeah. And moms and dads, it's the same thing. We all want our kid to be the next LeBron or the next <laughs> Olga Corbett or the next you know, Serena Williams right. or Barry Bonds. Probably not going to happen. Don't discourage them. Right. But – don't tell them they're going to be, right? Tell them try to be. Yeah. And just that'll keep you hungrier. They'll work harder. And then the parents can relax a little bit. I had a buddy ask me if I would ever coach, go back and coach Dublin High School. Yeah. And the, the parents listen to this? <laughs> I hope. hope so. And I said, <laughs> the only place I would coach is at an orphanage oh. <laughs> where there's no uh, parents around. Oh, I, I agree. It's like parents are uh, the uh, ones uh, that. Dude, my girl's mom's word, she's just as guilty as screaming and yelling. I'm like, no, stop, stop. (laughs) I'd go down the left field line and just be like, I can't do it. Right. Yeah, just have, the kids have to have fun. Yeah. And play a bunch of stuff. All right, so Kent, we have a tradition here on Link Ahead to finish each episode asking rapid fire questions to our guests. So we know you're more than ready for this. So let's just jump in. Mm. What visiting MLB stadium was the loudest to play in? Uh, The Metrodome. When we played in the 91 World Series there, it was unbearable. And then sitting in the bullpen, they're literally right here. Yeah. It's the loudest. I think they said it was louder decibel-wise. It was louder than a 747. Oh, oh, my, my gosh. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. If you had to pick three guys you really like striking out, who were they? Barry Bonds. <laughs> I got Tony Gwynn once, which was – that's kind that's of my bucket list. That's my bucket list. <laughs> and probably Chipper Jones. Wow. Just because I played with him and it was one of those got you <laughs> type yeah, yeah. Now let's flip it. Which three guys did you really hate pitching to? Oh, man. <laughs> Scott Rowland, Jeff Kent, who you guys, if you're yeah. Indian fans, probably yeah. remember, who should be in the Hall of Fame, by the way. Yeah. Uh, there's so many. How could I just limit it to one more? <laughs> there's like 428 more guys I could list right now. Uh, you know what? Probably uh, Edgar Martinez. Yeah. With the yeah. Mariners. Oh, yeah. yeah. Solid could hit leader. the same fastball, three different plays. He could hit the same fastball to left, right, or right up yeah. the middle. You played for some really great managers, too. So, above all else, a great baseball coach or manager is? Is consistent, supportive, and simple. I mean, that's what made Bobby Cox so good. He, he, he had the same, same set of rules, three rules. Show up on time. Play hard and play the game right and don't embarrass the team. <laughs> yeah. And, and by embarrass, that doesn't mean don't make an error right, or right, give right, up a home yeah. run. That means don't look like a fool and do stuff off the field that makes us look bad. It's pretty simple, yeah. you know, and, and you play harder for guys like that. Dusty Baker was one is – I love that man, and he's just awesome. But that's – it's simple. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We got one set of rules for everybody. It doesn't matter if you've got a day or you've been a 20-year all-star. Same rules for everybody. 
Wow. If you don't run a ball out, you can sit right next to me. Didn't care if it was David Justice, Andrew Jones. Didn't care. Sit down. Wow. You don't want to play the game right, you're not going to play. Wow. All right. You already said you're not superstitious, so I'll throw one in here. What was more fulfilling, the no-no or the grand slam? Oh, Grand Slam. <laughs> <laughs> Are you being serious? I'm 100% serious. That was more fulfilling than... <laughs> well, it, do you have time for a quick story on yeah, that? Yeah, of course. Because it's dumb, but it's a <laughs> fact. Well, I was a pitcher, so I'm sure. more yeah. likely to throw a no-hitter, I guess, right. than hit a Grand Slam. But that was the game. We were in Florida. Mark McGuire was with the Cardinals. Big Mac hit two that night. Yeah. So he broke Hack Wilson's. National League home run record. I think it gave him 59. Okay. So I hit Grand Slam, and I'm digging myself. And, and <laughs> I can't find it on video anywhere, by the way. That's the one I really? wish I had. I would have. I would send it every year on that date to every friend I have. <laughs> but so after the game, a kid comes in, or they pull him down in the concourse, and, and one of the clubhouse guys comes over and says, hey, the kid that got your Grand Slam balls out there, He's got it for you. And usually you sign something for him. Right. So I went yeah. out and I said, uh, yeah, hey, thanks, whatever. He go, I go, what do you want for it? You know, do you want me to? He goes, can you give me a Mark McGuire autograph? <laughs> <laughs> so I just grabbed the kid and his dad and mom or, the rest, or his dad was there. I go, get in here. So I brought him right oh, over to Big Mac's awesome. locker. Aww. And then the next day in the paper, headline, Mark McGuire breaks Hack Wilson's. And then like, our, and I actually pitched really good that night, which was <laughs> That was a rare year for me to pitch well. <laughs> Grand slam. And then at the very last point, oh, by the way, Merker went seven, gave up one run, and uh, hit a grand slam. And I'm just like, that's it? Aww. That's all I got? Footnote. <laughs> but no, I'd, honestly, it's hard to go against the no-hitter, but right. that grand slam just felt great. That's awesome. It really did. So what's the best <laughs> attribute a baseball pitcher can have? Amnesia, which we talked about. <laughs> but you, you've just got to be – you got to be competitive, but you can't be emotional. You know, uh, again, a young when I was a young player, just in professional baseball, young manager told me, if someone shows up in the seventh inning or sixth inning and the scoreboard's broken, mm -hmm. they shouldn't be able to know whether you're pitching, a, throwing a no-hitter or you've given up ten right. runs. Right. They should not be able to see it because yeah. hitters will see it. Right. If they see you getting frustrated, so I would say just be competitive, be consistent, but just – You've got to be emotionless out there. That's where I go wrong. And when you, <laughs> well, yeah, and, we, and I do it in pickleball all the time. The first thing I've ever thrown in my life out of anger was a pickleball powder. I'm like, are you serious? I <laughs> like, what, I can't take it that serious. All right, you're at a game these days. What's your go to stadium food or treat? I'm an eight year old, so I go with the corn dog. <laughs> I, I'm a corn dog guy anywhere I can find a corn dog. The next pickleball tournament you plan to enter? I'm playing the U.S. Open again in April, and then I'm playing in the Cincinnati, the, the PPA tournament in Cincy in May, and then Middletown tournament in August. Kent, we seriously could talk all day here, but we have to wrap things up. So thank you so much oh, for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. Enjoyed it. And to our listeners, thank you as well for taking the time to connect with your city. Tune in next time as we continue to explore the many personalities and experiences that make Dublin a thriving place to live, work, and grow.